Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. Oh, we're getting in the weeds tonight, folks. This is going to be complicated. Lots of moving pieces. It'll be fun, though. We got we got to we got we got to have a little bit of a panel discussion because there's some big issues going on. And I have to say that we're recording this on April 10th. So the issues are perhaps a little bit more complex than we originally planned when we scheduled this conversation. But that's OK. My guests are up for it. Um, tonight, we're going to have a big conversation around municipal provincial relations stuffs. And I'm hedging it that way because we're going to be talking about a couple of different things. We're going to be talking about the conversation that's going on in Calgary and that already went on in Edmonton around upzoning. What is it? Why is it bad or not? So many questions. We're going to be having a conversation about the environmental impacts potentially of upzoning. We're going to have a conversation about the financial impacts of uh, upzoning potentially. And we're going to have a conversation about the relationship between municipalities and the provincial government. I think that part might get spicy in order to have this conversation. I'm very excited to welcome to the show three folks who know way more about this stuff than I do. Bringing into the show tonight, Catherine Davies, Michael Jans, and Robert Tremblay. And rather than screw up their introductions myself, I'm going to give them the opportunity to do it. And we're going to start with Catherine. Catherine, who are you? What do you bring in? Hi, well, I'm Catherine Davies, and I'm a volunteer with a group called More Neighbors Calgary. We are a pro-housing organization. We formed in June of last year after Calgary City Council voted to reject its own housing affordability task force. <laughs> and in the in the 24 hours between the time that they rejected it and then realized that they'd made a bit of an error and came back and voted to approve it, More Neighbors Calgary was formed. So it was very spontaneous, but I think it had been brewing for a long time. I think there was a sense that we needed pro-housing voices to be speaking up in Calgary, and that was the catalyst for the event. So we are volunteer-led, grassroots, no affiliation with any kind of other organizations, and I'm really glad to be here today. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Robert Tremblay is the man who wears many, many hats, uh, none literal tonight, but probably a few figurative ones. So, Robert, uh, you've been on the show a few times, but I ask you to do it anyways. Who is Robert Tremblay? What are you, what are you here for tonight? Yeah, thanks, Nate. Um, so, yeah, I'm Robert Tremblay. I'm the co-chair of the Calgary Climate Hub. Um, so we're also a grassroots organization focused on local climate advocacy. Um, I guess, you know, I've, you know, just thinking about it for this intro, I've been in the game a little while now, I think maybe four years almost with the Climate Hub. So I don't know if I can call myself a longtime climate advocate yet, but maybe getting there. Um, typically, I've, you know, focused on electricity and transportation a lot more, but um, zoning is also a really important vector for climate action. And I think um, what's one of the things that's unique about it is it's something that, you know, at least traditionally is is purely municipal jurisdiction. So um, I think it's something that Calgary can do all on its own. And that itself is a big deal. Um, you know, sprawl is a uh, you know, big vector for uh, climate change and for increasing emissions in Calgary. So doing what we can to curb that and guide more development to the city is a big deal. So looking forward to talking about that more. Thanks, Nate. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. Last but certainly not least, all the way from snowy maybe maybe not probably not because we've got this this whole climate change drought thing happening uh edmonton counselor michael jans counselor if thanks you for know. having me yep i uh my name is michael jans i'm uh, up here in treaty six territory and i am the city council for ward papasteo all of our wards have indigenous names and so i'm the representative for what's kind of like kind of like courtney walcott's ward i'm the the university area the white avenue area a mix of some of the wealthiest mansions and also some of the uh, um, most in need new Canadians who have just, just arrived here. So got a good mix. Um, lots of infill around here, lots of change happening. And uh, yeah, I'm a housing advocate, a bike advocate, an active transportation and public transit uh, advocate. Uh, my family and I, we live uh, zero car family. We, we go car light. We, uh, we use car share and we're, you know, we're big enthusiasts of, uh, all the benefits of living in a city, take advantage of those public services. And uh, yeah, uh, before this, I was a school trustee for 11 years. So I did a lot of ed policy and um, 
my professional life, I worked for the equivalent of like the Federation of Calgary Communities. I worked for what's called the EFCL and uh, worked for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, a bunch of different orgs. And I've been at City Hall now since uh, October 2021. And just so I can refer to it later, which political municipal political party will you be affiliated with? So we we're we're talking about because we don't like it. We're all we're all independents. Um, and uh, we're talking about creating an independent party kind of as a joke, just to mock the whole thing. Like our only position is we're nonpartisan and uh, our platform is uh, member independence or something, you know, just kind of throw a party, but don't actually be a party and uh, and just make fun of the make fun of the charade that is take back Alberta and the UCP. Perfect. All right. We put, we put quotes around party <laughs> under signs. <laughs> Yeah, let's put the party back in political party. <laughs> there you go. Uh, that could be dangerous. Um, okay, so getting into it, Michael, I'm going to start with you first because Edmonton already did the very bad thing by many accounts. Uh, you you guys did the upzoning thing. So I'm going to ask you two questions to start with. What is upzoning? Uh, does it involve ladders? And why did Edmonton do it? Yeah, well, not not a ladder that goes more than three stories in the majority of the city. So it's a small ladder, if that. Um, upzoning is essentially a fancy term for legalizing housing. As your listeners know, zoning is the regulations, the red tape, if you will, what you're allowed to build where. And what we essentially did was um, it was one zoning across the city, most in almost all neighborhoods, single family homes. And over the last 10 years, we've been kind of cracking at that. So first we allowed lot splitting. You could take one lot and cut it into two. That allowed like two skinny houses. Then we allowed also laneway housing, like putting a, a granny flat out the back or another, like you could have a garage house. Then we allowed uh, basement suites. Then we removed parking minimums. And so now if you take like a uh, 50 foot lot, you can do eight units by right on that lot. So what that could mean is you could build a duplex, have two units, have basement suites in both of them, two more units and then have a double garage suite in the back, two more units. So um, just because, again, it's worth saying, just because you're allowed to do this doesn't mean you have to do this. It doesn't mean we've made single family homes illegal. You can still go and build single family home. But if you're in an area, like my neighborhood here by the U of A is less than 1% vacancy. So there's a major housing crisis here and rent is going up. We have the fastest rent increases in Canada. And so there's a demand for housing. So if you have an old home and you want to tear it down and put up something new, you have that option. Um, we also made it easier to um, uh, build other uh, other configurations, like a little more commercial, a little more mixed use, a little more um, apartments in different pieces in more areas. So we're going through we're going through all of that. So what we've essentially done is just legalized more housing across the city of Edmonton. Well, that sounds terrible. Is this part of the 15 minute cities where you're going to be like locking people in and everything? 100%. Ankle bracelets are on order from Amazon, but you know, yeah. Well, apparently the province is going to be going with ankle bracelets fairly soon. So <laughs> it's cool. Um, I, I make I make jokes. About We're going to need some minutes. Turkish Tylenol by the time this is over. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I make jokes about the 15 minute cities piece. But to be clear, when we're talking about, and we've said this before on the show, but I want to reiterate it. When we're talking about the concept of 15 minute cities, it's predominantly based on the idea. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the guy who's doing the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's predominantly based on the concept of everything that a person who lives in a neighborhood needs should be within 15 minutes of walking. Am I getting that right? Um, maybe walking, maybe bus, you know, it did to everybody. Edmonton kind of cheated. We said 15 minute car trip or 15 minute drive or 50. So it's kind of, yeah, but the, generally that is the concept that you should be able to walk or bike or, or roll, however, to get the needs closer to home. That's, that's the whole idea. Kind of this moving away from this post-war 1950s. This is a residential neighborhood. This is a business district and never the two shall meet. So it's about using our land better. It's about curbing urban sprawl. It's about being better for the planet, better for the city pocketbooks. It's about using our, our dollars more effectively to deliver services. And it's about improving quality of life, fighting loneliness, keeping rent down. We've seen other jurisdictions around the world who've taken a similar approach to Edmonton. Like uh, in the United States, there's been a couple of cities, I believe, uh, um, Austin is one. I, I think Minneapolis is another. Auckland in New Zealand. There's There's been many who have... Um, uh, legalized more housing and uh, um, it's it's helped keep rent down. It's added more choice. It's added more vibrancy. And uh, really it's it's quite exciting. Like Edmonton, remember, like we, 
Edmonton is a million, we're 1.1 million people. And then we have about five bedroom communities around us. Well, Calgary, you're at 1.5 million and it's kind of all. Well, we got the, we got the Airdries and the Chestermeres and the, yeah. the Okotokses is. Yeah. And Edmonton, Edmonton, like unlike Calgary, where you kind of have the the downtown in, in and out every day where your downtown is a major driver. Edmonton is a lot more, um, we, we have multiple nodes. So there's a lot of uh, employment in the West End or at the airport or downtown or at the university. So you have a lot more multi-directional transportation. And so it makes sense not to just sort of concentrate all of the housing and apartments downtown. You want to be able to spread out and give people choices wherever they live, however they want to live. So just to be clear, to your understanding, 15-minute cities are not about limiting mobility. They're about convenience, and that's... A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, the, what limits mobility is is, is cars. Cars are, uh, cars are a major problem in our cities, and, and, uh, and when everybody... I love driving, but if everybody exercises their right to drive at the exact same time, we have gridlock, we have traffic jams. So we got to offer people alternatives, be it bus, be it bike, be it... Um, uh, walkability, uh, anything else like that. Well, and your roads are terrible. Yep. Yep. The freeze thought cycle will do that. The potholes that we have to deal with. Did you know we have $10 billion worth of roads in Edmonton? Our inventory of roads is $10 billion. And in this eight year period, like the four years back and the four years forward, we are spending $4.2 billion on roads, $4.2 billion. That's, that's the price of the South Edmonton hospital. That is that is wild. And half of that is going towards just maintaining the roads, not even building new ones. Um, so you joke about the potholes, but yeah, it's a it's a major, major concern here. And as vehicles get heavier, as electric vehicles come in and they're heavy, as the big trucks come in, our roads just get trashed. Well, they're poorly designed too, but that's a whole other conversation. I was I was just there and got lost, I think, six times in the space of five minutes. So um, okay. So Michael, thank you, or counselor. Uh, chance. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction. So to sort of recap, Edmonton has done the upzoning to create more housing and all of those things. And Calgary hasn't yet entirely. Eh, Catherine, help me out here. Yeah, so there's a proposal on the table. It's going to go to council the week of April 22nd. There's going to be a public hearing that I think is going to be pretty spicy. And uh, the proposal is very similar to what Edmonton did last year. So uh, Calgary is proposing to essentially legalize what's called RCG or RG housing. And uh, I don't know how much detail you want on it, but our RCG, um, it stands for resident, sorry, residential contextual ground oriented and basically if you've seen these these little row houses on corner lots in like capitol hill or altador that's what this is it offers some other configurations as well so if you are in a single detached home and you have a basement suite and you want to add a laneway house as well this will allow you to do that so ultimately it's just going to add a lot of flexibility to our zoning code it's going to allow builders or individuals to build to the building form that they need to to suit their lives. Um, and it will allow us to build a lot more modest, more affordable housing. So that's a bit of a summary on it. Okay. Now, I mean, there's there's been some criticisms, and I'm going to ask for responses from from all three of you in a, in a, a few minutes here, but I'm going to let you go first. The, the two big criticisms that, that seem to be out there, the two big concerns that people seem to have in, in Calgary are kind of twofold. There's one around, ah, it's going to make parking a nightmare. But it almost seems like Councillor Jazz's comments about, well, maybe if less people had to drive less places, we could resolve that issue. Um, and then the other one seems to be, but I moved into this neighborhood because it was so big and spacious and I'm hard pressed to think of where in Calgary that still applies, except for maybe just a little bit south of the core where all the money lives. Um, but we see infills in most communities in Calgary. So what's your response to people who say but where will I park my six cars? And what's your response to people who say it's going to change the fabric of my community? Um, so I have a lot to say on this, and I'll try not to ramble too much. But I was uh, 
Oh, well, how many hours do we have? I was a community association volunteer for a long time. And I joined this committee because I thought, oh, I love my neighborhood. I like urban planning. Let's see what this is all about. And I was not prepared for just how strong neighborhood resistance to change is. So people find out that something in their neighborhood is changing and they don't like it. And they have these really visceral, instinctive reactions. And, you know, people who don't want their neighborhoods to change are you know, they're my friends, they're my neighbors, they're my relatives, they're great people. And it's, it's fine if they have these feelings, but um, we've just carried it a bit too far in Calgary for a long time. And we've uh, allowed uh, incumbent residents or existing residents to just block housing for a long time. Um, so I get that people don't want their neighborhoods to change, but we live in a city and we live in a society and we're facing some really serious problems. And I've tried to remind people in a polite way that zoning is not a contract. Like you may have liked the zoning in your neighborhood, but the city actually has the authority and the jurisdiction and really the obligation to change that zoning, you know, to address some of these major societal problems that we're facing. Um, I think to, um, there are some really great quotes from a woman called Jane Jacobs that many urbanists are familiar with. And she talks about just cities growing organically and cities being able to respond to the needs of people and this sidewalk ballet that you have in cities where, you know, people are really living there. And this idea of preserving your neighborhood in amber, you know, your neighborhood never changing, the character staying constant forever. It's just completely uh, out of place in a city. So, I, I mean, I'm really sympathetic to people who are struggling with this. And a lot of people are scared and a lot of people's feelings are real. But we have to be brave and we have to move past that. Um, you had a question about parking, too. So parking is the number one complaint that comes up. And so I, I like to keep in mind that zoning determines what can be built where, but it also determines who can live where. And it ultimately determines how people get around the city. And we have these building patterns in Calgary that have just baked in car dependence. And, you know, I live in a very centrally located neighborhood. I also live car light. We we have a car that we share with another household, but we can get almost everywhere by bicycle, on foot, public transit. My kids love taking the bus. And I think we need to let more people live in my neighborhood where they can be close to amenities, close to employment. And, you know, facilitating that allows people to make different transportation choices. Um, parking also is something that can be managed. And parking alone uh, is just not a sufficient reason to block housing for people. I mean, I'm curious, though, like you talk about the visceral reaction that people have. And I'll be I'll be honest, I live in a, a detached single family home um, and I have the space for two vehicles uh, in front of my my home. And I'm not going to lie when I when I get home and I pull up and, and somebody's having a house party down the block or something and somebody's in one of my spot. I know they're not my spots, but it feels like it. How do you get around that uh, that visceral reaction? Because cognitively, I totally know that that's not a guaranteed spot for me. It's it's public street. It's public parking. Anybody can park really whatever they want there. But there's still that, uh, I'll call it what it is, visceral entitlement that because it's in front of my house, well, damn it! I should be able to park there. How do you how do you how do you diffuse that reaction in people when it's such a big obstacle? Well, I think another aspect of this, just to jump in, and I'm definitely happy to give it back to Catherine to keep going on this, is you know th this process. You know, as as um, the councillor said, and as um, you know, Catherine said, um, you know, this isn't a mandate to build to build you know new fourplexes or you know new new denser developments. This is just allowing it. So this trend, you know, this is really setting us up for the long term to, to be able to be successfully developing more sustainably. But it's not like any individual block is just going to like, boom, 2025 have like eight times more houses on it and eight times more cars. You know, there'll be, you know, one block will maybe get one development and then five years later, it'll get another. So all of this will happen from the perspective of like an individual block pretty slowly. So like those two spots that are yours, like they'll probably be yours. And, you know, maybe 15 years from now, all of a sudden you'll be like, hey, like, I guess I don't park in front of my house as often anymore. And maybe, 
you know, based on those nudges or based on, you know, more businesses and more other kinds of development being around you, maybe there'll be different transportation choices that are, are viable then. But all that I think is going to happen at a speed that is you know, really manageable for people. So it's not, but I think the ability to kind of whip up fears of, of all of a sudden those spots are going to be taken away from you. And, you know, a situation that I think is frankly unrealistic and maybe to draw a parallel to other kinds of climate advocacy, people often, you know, with EVs say, oh, like the grid's not going to be handled, able to handle them. We'll have blackouts tomorrow. But it's the same thing. This transition is going to happen over decades, not overnight. So I think just like the grid will definitely be able to adapt to EVs as they come on. Um, so too will, I think, our, our street parking. But anyways, Catherine, happy to give it back to you um, on that. Yeah, I'm actually glad you jumped in because I do struggle with how to respond diplomatically to this question. And Councillor Jens, I'd be really curious to know how you respond to this in Edmonton. But, you know, there are always trade-offs. And uh, I had an interesting conversation with someone who was like, oh, the parking, but I'm not going to be able to park in front of my house. And I was like, well, are you are you willing to park halfway down the block if that means that more people can have places to live? And they conceded that maybe that would be OK with them. So, you know, there are trade offs and people's concerns are legitimate. And I just think that the concerns of people who are struggling to afford housing or struggling to find housing should carry more weight. And one more thing to just pepper in on this, too, you know, I think. There's, you know, we just had this big conversation and um, again, maybe I'll defer to uh, Catherine or maybe uh, the council's expertise. So I'm just uh, being, having dealt with transit um, in a different city. But, you know, with transit, we just had this conversation around, you know, are we going to have um, a primary transit network or are we going to, um, you know, like a transit network with a few kind of critical, critical lines that are served really well, or are we going to keep trying to serve transit everywhere? And the problem in a city like Calgary, which is you know, predominantly, you know, single detached homes, the relatively low density, it's it's really hard to serve good transit up to communities where there's you know not a lot of people in them relative to other places, right? So as we're as we're starting to build that customer base for the transit network, we're gonna be able to have much better transit service that's gonna enable a lot more parking to be freed up because people won't need to have two cars that are probably already frankly hard to afford. Like current car insurance is crazy in Alberta. Like that's one of the primary motivators for why um, my house downsized from one car to, or sorry, from two cars to one. Um, and, you know, like where I live, I live, you know, in an inner city neighborhood that has density, you know, frankly, a decent amount beyond what's going to be legalized with uh, this measure. And there's actually like a lot of parking in my community. Like I, we used to have two cars and we had no problem parking, you know, basically on the same block uh, every day. Um, but we have, you know, really great access to the C train. We've got a cycle track that's like 30 meters from, from where I live. So it's also easy for lots of other people to also not drive and free up those parking spots for other folks. I think that's what opponents often get wrong is they forget that these changes take a really long time and that we're talking decades. Like, like uh, just because you upzone a neighborhood doesn't mean the whole neighborhood is going to change overnight. We're talking like there's a finite amount, amount of construction labor, a finite amount of capital, a finite amount of just available space. Like unless your neighbor puts their house up for sale, it's probably not going to be changing unless they want to do something to it. And even if it does, it's unlikely that your entire block is going to be changing. So I think critics often, we what we here's sort of the lessons learned from Edmonton. Some of the critics tried to catastrophize this right away. They said that you'd be getting an eight story uh, apartment building next to your house. And it was shown that's not true. Actually, in fact, the eight stories are very limited. And, and in fact, they would need to go through a public hearing process just like they would today. Nothing is changing there. Um, even when, like, even when this bylaw has passed, it's been six months, you're not seeing dramatic changes. You're not seeing, you know, entire blocks being raised and, and, and uh, uh, events happening. And we repeal parking minimums. Like, so you can have a zero parking building, but you know why, like the, the factor why there aren't more zero parking buildings is because the banks won't give you financing for a zero parking building. They'll give you a car less building. So it used to be you had to have basically two bedroom apartment, two stalls of parking. Now it's was was with no parking minimum. The the buildings are still coming in at like 60% parking. So there's less, which means it's more affordable. The cost per door is lower, but they're still having parking because they know most apartments even have a, even if they use it less, they probably want a stall of parking. So um, even some of the concerns of neighbors about like they take it to the limit, they catastrophize it. The idea is often more scarier than the reality. 
And once it goes in, nobody notices. Like we allowed um, the height to be increased from, you could go up to 10 meters uh, in a residential area. Now you can go up to 11 and a half meters. But you're in, if you're in the new suburban area, you, you've been able to go to 12 meters for, you know, 20 years. So um, most people though, when you're walking by, they can't eyeball what 10 and a half meters is or 11 meters is. It's just, some of this is a fear of change. Some of this is a fear of their own financial loss. And um, I can tell you, like we talked to the city assessor, the, the, like the tax department and said, okay, if I put in a, a six story apartment building on your block, does it destroy the value of the neighborhood? And they ran the numbers and they said, no, it doesn't. Um, if you're right beside, if you are the home that's right beside, we'll give you a little bit of deduction in value, but that's only for the immediate home right beside it. It's not the home down the block. It's not the home four blocks over, but there's this outdated sort of post-war stereotype that apartments bring crime, apartments bring renters, apartments devalue your home or your community or your asset. But it's proven to, the data shows that that's, that's absolutely not the case. I'm curious, Catherine, I want to ask you, and then I'm going to get to, to some of my environmental questions with, with Robert. Um, but Catherine, riffing on what Chancellor Jans just said there, it it there is, and I mean this is probably a difficult part of the the conversation in regards to what people's hesitations are, what people's reservations are. There's no question. There's a housing crisis. Everybody and their dog is talking about a housing crisis all over, not just Alberta, but but the whole country. Um, there's no question that there's an, a significant issue with affordable housing where. There's a greater need for houses that don't cost many, many, many zeros. The implication that some people take away from that, though, let's call it what it is, is that, oh, if we do affordable housing in my neighborhood, that that's that means that it's going to be the, the poor people moving in here and those poor people with their poor people, things and habits. I just don't know how I feel about that. But there's also, I think, I've heard um, expressed on, on some of the grosser parts of Facebook, uh, there's also a concern of, ah, uh, that's where the immigrants are going to move into. So, I mean, what is more neighbors sort of, I can see you're bristling already, but <laughs> what is more neighbors response to that? Yeah. So, okay. So I mentioned that I was a community association volunteer for a long time. You know, I would field emails and comments from neighbors about neighborhood change. And for the most part, like I said, my neighbors are wonderful people. You know, they have these reactions, but you'll have a conversation with them and they, you know, they, they come around and they can be good with change. Um, Occasionally though, I, you know, I got some emails or there would be issues with people. And sometimes they actually said the quiet part out loud and said really ugly things about people of a different socioeconomic uh, status or people of different cultural backgrounds. And um, I've read a couple of books that talk about the history of zoning. And when you dig into it a bit, um, there was one in particular, I think it was the city of Berkeley in California. And they were one of the first cities to adopt a zoning code I think around 1916. And so they were separating uh, uses. So they wanted to separate Chinese laundries from, you know, the rest of the city. But it was actually the Chinese part that they wanted to separate more than the, you know, the idea of having this laundry in your in your residential area. And so there is actually a legacy of explicit racial segregation in zoning. I really don't I haven't encountered a lot of that personally, uh, but there is definitely a lot of socioeconomic exclusion. And I don't even know if some people are aware of how they come across when they talk about trying to protect their neighborhood. But sometimes it becomes clear that they're very concerned about the types of people uh, that they'll have to interact with if you suddenly have housing at a lower price point than, than maybe the neighborhood is used to. Um, and I don't... <laughs> I, I struggle. I really struggle with this. Um, I live in an area of the city that has a high proportion of renters. And uh, there have been, you know, I've had wonderful neighbors on my block. And I've had people, you know, of different races or different cultural heritage, ter 
cultural backgrounds. We've had people living on our block who are newcomers to Canada. Um, and actually the best neighbors that we ever had, they, to be honest, they were of a lower socioeconomic status. Like they struggled financially and they eventually had to move because the landlord raised their rent $50 and it was uh, really hard for us to see them go. And I think with some people, you're never going to you're, you're never going to get there in convincing them that, oh, you, you know, the people that are going to move to your neighborhood are going to be fine. Um, I think a lot of people, if you if you sit down with them and you you, you, you try to help them understand, um, like they're, they're they're just people. There are neighbors. Generally, they're fine. A, a lot of people can become okay with it. But I think there is, you know, we talk about these instinctual, visceral reactions. Sometimes it's to seeing a car parked in front of your house, but sometimes it's also like a, a worry about who the people are going to be. And I, I just think those are not valid concerns. They're not legitimate reasons, again, to block housing from being in your neighborhood. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you at all. I think you're you're absolutely right. I I find myself wondering, um, when it comes to these conversations about the increased density, uh, I find myself wondering if if I have some strong opinions about gentrification because I lived in Kensington for years and years and years and what they did to the Lido was, for me personally, just not okay. But you have to know what the Lido is in Calgary. I'm getting really inside baseball here. But um, the the reality is there were pros and cons to the gentrification of sort of that that Kensington Sunnyside area. It did present a lot more housing options for people. It did create some uh, more availability of housing. It did also ratchet up the prices a little bit. But I can't help but wonder if in in some areas, because let's be let's be honest, Calgary does absolutely have uh, those areas. You know, you, there's the, we see every year the comical little map that comes up where it's like, this section of Calgary is the old money. This section of Calgary is the new money. And then we start to label Northeast Calgary and things get uncomfortable really quickly. Um, this seems to me like an opportunity for some of those areas that have historically been stigmatized to increase their density in really positive ways. Am I reading that wrong, do you think, Catherine? Um, I wouldn't say you're reading that wrong. I think, uh, you know, gentrification and displacement are really, really complicated issues and maybe a topic for another day. Um, I will say, though, you know, you talk about neighborhoods with old money. So if those neighborhoods with, and I don't really like that term, but yeah, I, it, it, let's use it as a stand in. If certain neighborhoods are full, they're not letting anyone else in, they're not allowing any new housing to be built then, you know, people who aspire to those kind of neighborhoods will go the next tier down and they'll, you know, outbid people. And eventually, you know, if you if you close off or if you gatekeep uh, neighborhoods, certain neighborhoods, then people have to go elsewhere. And then they start to outbid you know, longtime residents and and then the fabric of that community starts to change. Um, I do think one of the reasons that citywide rezoning is so important is that right now we're seeing really concentrated areas of rapid redevelopment. And I happen to live in one of those neighborhoods. So I think that eight, between eight and 9% of all of Calgary's RCG uh, zoned residential land is in my neighborhood. And we're seeing a lot of really rapid turnover. We're seeing a lot of rental displacement because older bungalows are being snapped up as fast as they can be to build RCG housing. And I think it's really important to to consider the fact that if this is permitted citywide, you're not going to see that intense pressure on any one particular neighborhood. So like uh, Councillor Jans talked about, it can sort of happen a bit more naturally, a bit more organically. Um, you won't have these, uh, you know, land speculators or, you know, whatever, trying to, to acquire as much property as they can. So um, I'd be really curious, actually, though, to see how Councillor Jans responds to this. I think part of it, you see those neighborhoods that concentrate so much because those sometimes those are the areas that were the only areas where you were allowed to do the density or do the apartments. So what we saw for like, look at look at most neighborhoods in Calgary, you'll have like a, a 12 to 20 story apartment and then you'll have all single family detached homes like you you have one or the other because for years that's all what all that was allowed. So 
we talk about the missing middle, the idea that if you allow more row housing, more gentle density, more multi, like multifamily, multiplex, you won't get those same medium to high density because it doesn't make sense economically to do those major projects when you can do these quick, incremental, adaptive, fast um, builds. It's not cheap to build super tall apartments. You need a lot of concrete. You need a lot of um, you need a lot of investment. You need you and that all of that becomes really really hard. So if other neighborhoods had been more welcoming to to medium scale to low scale density, maybe Kensington wouldn't have been as uh, expensive and it wouldn't have peaked as high as it did. Maybe it would allow more housing choices more often. I'm just super bitter about the Lido. That will that will never. I'm never going to resolve that for myself, but I want to move on in the 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 topics uh, because this was one of the big questions that that I you know when when Robert first pitched this to me, one of the first questions that I had was, okay, well, what are the environmental impacts? And on one hand, I there's a part of me that totally digs what you guys are saying about the oh transit piece. And then there's the other part that goes where I live. That's a dirty, dirty lie. Um, and I, for context, I live in north central Calgary, where we've been promised the green line for like four decades now. And it doesn't matter how much we build up here. We still can't get a freaking sea train. So there's a part of me that has a little bit of skepticism in regards to the, the increased transit. But that being said, because if I didn't verbalize that, I'd feel like a sellout. Um, that being said... Robert, what are the environmental impacts of greater density? Are we talking about more resources being used? Are we talking about more wastage? Give me sort of the 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 climate hub high level view of this policy change. Yeah, so I think you know where I've kind of you know I've been talking about this issue I think for probably getting close to a year now and I think you know only in the last month I think I came up with with this at least I think I came up with this um, is, you know, I think the re way we should be thinking about density and upzoning in the context of the city is it's, it's kind of like energy efficiency for the city and, you know, kind of along, along two different factors. So one is transport and one is, you know, the building emissions directly. So, you know, just if we're building, you know, and again, I don't want to oversell the amount of density that is on the table here with RCG. It's, this is kind of the next ratchet up from, from single detached development, but um, you know, as we're building more density, densely, you're going to have, you know, people living closer to where they actually want to be in the city, right? Because those housing choices will be available. You'll just even just geometrically, you'll be able to accommodate more people. So, you know, I'm sure we've all heard, you know, the term drive till you qualify. This should probably, you know, start to curb that down a little bit, right? Like we're offering more affordable kinds of units in, you know, probably the inner city. But, you know, as as we've um, you know said, you know, I think also just across the city as well. Um, so I think that's going to help people, you know, just drive less in the cars they already have, you know, as, as, um, you know, as we're burning less gas, you know, and increasingly, um, using less electricity, that's going to be helpful. Um, I should say, you know, around a third of Calgary's emissions come from us burning gas and diesel in our vehicles. So that's a, it's pretty significant. Um, this is also going to enable non-car modes like transit, walking, wheeling, and cycling. And, you know, I think different areas of the city, it's going to be, you know, different solutions are going to be better. You know, I think I'm a pretty big believer in electric vehicles and, you know, Catherine can back this up. I've had arguments with some of our uh, mutual friends about, you know, how important EVs are or aren't to the, to the energy transition. I, I think they're very important, but, you know, it's really important to have these other modes as well. Um, just to take a second on that, like, you know, EVs, I think are, you know, critically important. Like we've got over a million vehicles on the road in Calgary and, you know, what it means to get to net zero by 2050 is we're going to have to figure out what to do with all millions of all of those millions of vehicles. Um, so, you know, I think a large chunk of those probably will be electrified, but the less we need to electrify, it's, it's going to be a lot easier. Like I fully believe we can solve any of the kind of challenges that EVs present, but the less we have to actually work to solve those challenges, you know, like upgrading the grid, adding more electricity supply, um, you know, ramping up and manufacturing for EVs and ramping up all the supply chains and, you know, critical minerals that we know we're going to need. Again, I'm bullish we're going to be able to do all of that. But the less we have to do that, the more we can focus on other things because there's lots of other parts of climate action aside from EVs. So that's really important. And, you know, I think, you know, in lots of different contexts, you know, there's lots of different transit options as well. Um, you know, sorry, I'm kind of all over the place here, but just thinking back to your green line comment, Nate, like, 
you know, I'm bitter. I, the North deserves the North Green Line. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to not say that. We've all seen that. Uh, I forget it, there was. It was originally like a billboard, then it turned into a post, and now like the post is rotting. And it used to say like Green Line coming five years, and this was like back in like '77 or something. But um, you know, even you, if you, imagine the buses. Sorry, go ahead. Counselor. In addition, to, in addition to the transportation savings, have you ran yeah. the numbers on? Um, the actual like built form energy reductions uh, yeah. needed in duplexes, triplexes versus single family. Oh yeah, so it's a lot, lot less for sure. Um, so just going, yeah, just going back to the transit for a second. So I think you know, even just even you know, we're gonna get that green line, but even if we don't get it and we're able to justify having a bus every ten minutes or every fifteen minutes like that. That would that really changes, I think, the transit game in a lot of places too. Like having buses that are only coming every half an hour or every hour. And if you miss your bus, like now you're, you know, I forget if we said we're swearing, but like now you're fucked. Like <laughs> you're not, you know, you're not you're gonna be an hour late for work or you're gonna miss whatever you were you were going to. Like that's not something people are willing to deal with. And if you know, when I'm when I've been talking with lots of these non-car modes, like if they're not competitive with the conven convenience of driving, like people just aren't gonna do them, right? So that need you know that we could have a whole podcast about what that means, but um, yeah. So I think you know that's one half of it. It's the transportation emissions. I think the other half um, is probably you know more straightforward. Is just the, the building emissions. You know, right now, you know, as Councilor was saying before, you know, there's a missing middle in housing. So people are kind of forced into either apartments and you know due to other issues that we have with housing in the building code. You know, usually those apartments are just one or two bedrooms. Um, I'd love to queue up. Uh, Jan's to talk about point access blocks if he's interested, but, um, but, you know, either one or two bedroom apartments, or, you know, if you want to maybe have some kids or you just want more space, probably then you're looking at a, you know, three or four bedroom home, probably pretty far out. Cause again, drive so you qualify and there's not much in the middle. So you're probably ending up in a place that's, you know, is bigger or, or smaller than you'd like. And I think often, I think that's going to lead to people having more areas to heat um, getting back to kind of the emissions pie, about a third of Calgary's emissions come from burning natural gas in our in our buildings. So I think kind of being able to right size people's housing choice by kind of enabling more kinds of housing forms to be built will help um, reduce emissions a lot as well. And then just, you know, as simple as just even having less outside walls is pretty significant too with lots of these things. So if you're in a row house and, you know, on either side, there's another unit, you've got less area that's leaking heat out into the environment. So I'd say those are the two main things. Um Happy to keep rambling about it <laughs> more going I wanna, forward, I wanna, but I wanna, I wanna I'll leave it there for now. I want to yeah. dig in on something there because you said something that 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 caught my attention a little bit. Uh, you said a third of emissions come from vehicles uh, in Calgary. Um, mm -hmm. and a third come from natural gas. I thought natural gas was clean. I <laughs> well, the thing about that. <laughs> Methane's bad. Yeah. Yeah, and it, you know, a lot of this really depends on how you're thinking about the natural gas too. You know, if we wanted that 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 fact, you know, around a third, I'm sure is not taking into account the upstream upstream methane leakage or you know a lot of what we're starting to learn about um, about the gas grid now. I was just I could pass that up because that's a talking point for some folks. You know, it's interesting. I would I would kind of brace for this that you will get these sort of what I'll call the like the 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 green opponents who say well actually the most efficient energy efficient building is the one that already exists and don't mm -hmm. don't allow homes to be torn down and that doesn't hold up especially when you factor in transportation savings life savings like if you're able to take two people living in one house and change that into four people on one house that can now you know be closer to work and drive less like one we did this i think it's if you drive your car for one year you would need to plant or you would need, sorry, not plant, you would need 1,000 mature trees to offset the carbon from your car. And that's not planting. That would be 1,000 per year. So if you drive for five years, you know, do the math. So you'll get these folks who will say, well, infill cuts down house, infill cuts down trees, infill destroys communities, infill creates waste. You got to You got to put aside those arguments. They don't hold up when you do the math. And we have to always be thinking about like, what's the alternative? The alternative isn't that we can just freeze Calgary or Edmonton the way they are. The alternative yeah. is we're filling in wetlands like in around Ricardo Ranch and, you know, other pressures around the environment. You know, when we're thinking about biodiversity, one of the leading causes of the biodiversity crisis is, is urban sprawl, right? So if we're talking about, you know, 
environment that is probably pretty natural around the edge of the city, or we're talking about a tree in someone's front lawn, that environment around the edge of the city, even, you know, if it's not as sexy as, you know, whatever kind of tree this person has, is probably a lot more important for biodiversity than, um, yeah. you know, the manicured kind of garden someone might have in the front yard. One of the yeah. other big issues the the criticisms or talking points that has been raised around this policy is ah the cities they just want more property taxes and this is a bit of a double edged sword i think in a, in a lot of ways because one of the arguments for this i presume and i'm going to ask you to correct me if i'm wrong here councilor jans um is that yeah there, there there would in fact be more property taxes um i guess the the next question that you have to ask if that is true is is that necessarily a bad thing because one of the things that we are seeing in both of the major cities in alberta calgary and edmonton is that there are concerns about the the amount of money available to do the things cough green line cough um so to you first counselor jans um does this theoretically and i mean as as everybody here has pointed out we're talking about things developing over you know it's not overnight so it's not like you pass this policy and boom there's the five billion dollars in your couch cushions that you were looking for um does this policy is this policy projected to raise more money for the city of edmonton and does it stand that it would raise more money for Calgary? And I'll ask Councillor Jans that question. Yeah, it would absolutely raise more money, but it would also save the city money because right now the growth that you have in Calgary is more sprawl. So to Rob's point, unless you're going to freeze the city in, in amber and leave it be forever, um, costs are going up, inflation is going up, gas is going up, services are going up. Uh, you wonder why it's hard to fix the roads, to cut the grass, to to fund the police, to fund the fire department, whatever the services you want to talk about. Um, that is because, you know, there's a, a prop, you know, property taxes either go up or you increase the assessment base, in which case everybody pays less tax or the same tax. Um, but you're able to eat those costs by a higher assessed value. Cities in Alberta only have three levers to generate revenue. One, property tax. Two, user fees, like admissions, uh, um, permit fees, whatever. And then number three, grow the assessment base. That's it. Um, we can't put toll roads in. We can't have a hotel tax. We can't have a GST. We can't do anything like that. We're not like Toronto or other cities. We don't have big city powers. We're really running the same operating system as we did in 1905. It is property tax or user fees. So unless we want to double the price of the bus or double the price of other goods and services that people rely on to participate, unless we want to charge money for going to the library, um, we have to generate revenue. And by increasing the tax base while cutting down on the service burden. So for example, when it snows in Edmonton, sometimes our snowplow, like the, 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 the drivers on an eight hour shift, sometimes the first hour of that is just driving out to where they need to start clearing the snow. Then they got to clear the snow for the six hours and then drive back, right? So like it, it just the operating cost, the uh, response times for the police, driving to where they need to go, um, cutting the grass, all of these pieces, like it, what we're doing right now in our current growth pattern is so incredibly inefficient and expensive. Um, and the wear and tear on our buses, on our fire engines, on our vehicles, um, on our communities, on the car dependency that even on the original, uh, the, the, you know, the personal pocketbook as, as, uh, as my friend said earlier, like the cost of car ownership is like 1300 bucks an hour, 1300 bucks a month. And that's from, that's from rate hub. That's an insurance company. They're saying 15 grand a year to insure your car. And that, because people don't factor in depreciation and everything else, that's the cost of car ownership, not, not, not just insurance. So as you know, as a city, if we want to be more affordable, if we want to be more welcome, I mean, if we're going to grow Alberta to 10 million people, as the premier says, um, yeah, we got to come up with some creative solutions. And so this is very much revenue positive for the city, but that's not the only motivation. Now, I want to also sort of dig into the, the revenue positive for the city piece, because unless I'm mistaken, and I could be, um, the cities aren't the only ones who benefit from property taxes. Am I getting that right? There is also an educational property tax component that goes straight to the provincial government. So there's the municipal property tax that goes to city hall 
but then all we do is collect the tax bill for the property tax and that goes to the provincial government and that goes into their general revenue and then they distribute it as they see fit. So they, yeah, they get a taste here too. So I guess, um, you know, Edmonton has been uh, the subject of not small criticism from the provincial government lately. There was a whole little, little press conference they, they did about it where they talked about, oh, uh, you know, well, we're standing by in case Edmonton needs assistance. Now, that conversation may very well have changed in the last 12 hours. Once again, we're recording this on April 10th. Um, but, you know, there's there's there there are financial challenges that exist in the municipalities. Um, is this do you think long term that this will be an effective way to address those financial challenges or is this just one little thing and eh, you shouldn't worry about it that much? It's it's important. It's about building a more efficient city. I mean, we can't change the growth pattern for our city for the last hundred years, but we have to curb urban sprawl. It is losing us money. We did a study in Edmonton. There's six new neighborhoods in an, an area called Decoteau. And in the life cycle of Decoteau, we're losing $400 million. And that's $400 million in 2014 dollars. So over the next 25 years, we are losing money every year. New homes do not make the city money. They cost the city money. And I really recommend Calgary's Feature did a great Urban Sprawl Explained video. You can throw in the show notes. Um, it's uh, fantastic. And yeah, this is this is becoming a critical piece, not just for affordability for residents, but affordability for the cities, um, meeting our climate targets, just improving the livability and quality of life for everyone in our communities. People forget that generally you can't drive for the first 20 years of your life and the last 20 years of your life. And we got a lot of people who are getting older who are going to be seniors and do you want them to be stranded forever once they have to give up their driver's license? Is that is that the path for our parents that they're just going to be kind of left adrift on an ice flow? So no, we need to build communities that are more walkable, that have choices, that have amenities closer to home. And uh, uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of retrofit that we need to do to our existing cities. And what Calgary's doing is a very, very, very modest step in the right direction. I mean, I, I think you're right about the sprawl piece. I don't think the impact of sprawl in, in Calgary can be understated. I mean, I would make the argument that uh, the the best municipal podcast uh, in Calgary, if not Alberta, I mean, they're literally called the sprawl yeah. because of the the weight. Catherine, I want to I, I want to come back to you because I noticed that as soon as Councillor Jans started talking about sprawl, you were nodding emphatically. So, I mean, did you have anything that you want to add to what he just said there? Yeah. So I'm looking at this great Venn diagram. And uh, if you follow the Climate Hub on Twitter, they tweet it all the time. But it it has these three circles of stable services, low density, and low taxes, and you can't have all three. And in Calgary, for a long time, we've been uh, we've been trying to get there, and we've been you know subsidized through various other means. But I think we're coming to grips with the fact that we just cannot afford to keep sprawling. Um, and I was just going to say that I was in, in a conversation with someone about rcg zoning because that's all i talk about these days and she was like oh it's just a tax grab for the city and i was like it it's your money like you're a taxpayer do you not want the city to be managing its finances more more efficiently and and uh, it was kind of a, a light bulb moment for her but uh, i totally agree and i'll just add you know i have a very low carbon footprint and it's actually you know i'm very committed to the climate but I'm also very frugal. And we often talk about like pitting uh, climate uh, action against the economy. But I think in the context that we're discussing right here, both at an individual level and at a municipal level, these are things that are absolutely aligned. We can talk about fiscal sustainability and uh, environmental sustainability, and they're essentially the same thing. So uh, um, I think R Rob and I were talking earlier about the just the cross-partisan nature of this, um, you know, there are people on the conservative side and people on the liberal side who tend to find absolute agreement on a lot of these issues. And um, you can find fiscally, the fiscally conservative solutions and the environmentally sustainable solutions are the same. I think you're you're bang on there. I think that that one of the the things that we see all too often in the conversation when it gets to the politicization of these issues is 
you know, you, if, if you talk, if you talk to a fiscal conservative, this makes sense. And if you talk to somebody who's concerned about the environment, this makes sense. But if you talk to somebody who wants a political football, well, then they're going to light their hair on fire because they want a political football is sort of my my impression of that. And speaking of political footballs. And before we jump to that, can I intercept it and ask, so are you looking for public speakers? How is the 22nd going to go? How does that work? Yeah, I, I can just start it off and I'll, I'll hand it off to, to Catherine. So, you know, definitely, I think driving more folks out to speak at councils was our pro probably, I'd say, our primary tactic. You know, definitely we're doing okay. stuff like this. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to get to that. Oh, all okay. right. Well, we can come back to it if you want. At the end. All right. All right. All right. OK, <laughs> I'll just say like a little bit, you know, definitely it's a it's a primary tactic and we'll talk more about it at the end. But, um, you know, I think it's an important part. And um, but, you know, we're also doing op ads. We're doing stuff like this podcast episode. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to be the Thunderdome of, of public hearings <laughs> in Calgary based on what I've heard so far. Like, um, you know, this is just the rumor mill. So take it for what you will. But I've heard there's already close to 150 people signed up so that would be pushing it for you know that would be kind of maybe called like a category category four public hearing in calgary so oh, how many how many minutes do speakers get uh five and then you know <laughs> counselors can ask questions yeah 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 well, ours took ours took like four or five days um i think we mm -hmm. had over 350 speakers and you know what was interesting is like it kind of was parody in terms of um for and against, which really changed the media narrative around this thing. It went from like the week before it was like, oh my God, the world's going to end. And then actually once like in day one, there were so many speakers in favor uh, mm -hmm. and it shifted it and was like, oh, actually like, and the, the narrative was a lot more balanced from there. And also what we saw was it gave social license for other people in the neighborhood who are like, well, I, I don't have a problem with this, but I see everybody else is upset. So I don't want to say anything. It actually allowed space for the silent majority to come forward. And uh, um, some people didn't even take their five minutes. They just signed in and they were like, hey, my name is Michael. I'm here because I support this. I think it's great for Edmonton. And I'm here if you want any questions for me. I live in this neighborhood. People are so like it, we made mm -hmm. it a very low barrier for people to participate. And uh, that was that was great. Um, we, we had some hilarious stories from it, though. Like there's the usual suspects, but like one interesting observation that and I think we need to kind of unpack a bit, too, is like almost everyone who is opposed to it um, was was over 50, maybe over 60. And almost everyone who was for it was under 50, maybe under 40. And so they're really, you could really feel this generational hole. And at one point, uh, an opponent stood up who I think was in his 70s and he stood up and he said, this whole process has been hijacked by young people. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like he's like, you shouldn't like this. And it was this this moment of like, you could feel power slipping through his fingers of like, no, like I run this town, we're in charge, not you. And you could feel it just sort of like, you know, metaphorically turning to sort of um, his words sort of turning to dust there because yeah, like the young people were coming out and saying like, we're in a crisis. We do, we do need help. So I, I would say if you have anybody who's interested, just even if they sign up for a minute, it's a huge help, especially as a counselor being able to actually see. And though it doesn't matter, like, if you have 104 and 101 against, it doesn't mean you vote against. But at least if you're seeing parity or mm -hmm. close to speakers, it really does change the narrative. Totally. And I think a, like a weird thing that to me seems to happen with these really big public hearings is it's almost to me like the more speakers and, you know, the bigger it gets, the more it almost starts to take on kind of <laughs> electoral dynamics, like you're saying, you know, 104, 100 against. And I think... Yeah that's hard to convey to people because i think you know when you ask someone hey do you want to come you know speak at council they almost feel like oh i need some like expertise or i need to be like especially yeah. affected by it but i tell them you know i'm like no like you're just you're a citizen of this city and you're showing up to tell council i'm here because i care enough about this issue that i'm asking you to say yes and then really that's all you have to say based on your values but with that i guess going back to that kind of you know electoral dynamics i think it's interesting because, you know, I think, you know, frankly, like I've, you know, have background in like political campaigns as well. And I like to me, like, I think what I've tried to do is apply a little bit more of kind of campaign tactics to some of, you know, what what we're doing as far as, you know, getting almost like getting out the vote for this public hearing. Um, but, you know, I think the other side is also doing that. And I think, you know, a, a dynamic that, you know, this is just really my own kind of analysis than anything I've heard or seen, but you know, I have to wonder how the recall, the recall Gondek um, campaign is going to flow through into this. And I think that's definitely something to watch 
I know I, I forget the guy's name, but the guy who started it um, said even on Twitter, he's Daniel like, Smith, you know, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm not I'm not going to comment, but no. but um, yeah, whatever that guy's name was, um, I I think he said like on Twitter, like the next thing I'm going after is um, aside from Councillor Devong was um, the next thing I'm going after is we're going to stop this stop this rezoning. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, are these folks who we probably can think of, you know, the usual suspects at these things, you know, the convoys and, you know, the acts of tax rallies, are they going to be showing up at this public hearing now? Um, so I don't know, that's something I'll be watching for as well. Maybe, but that, that may end up alienating them more. And it may, like, we've had 15 minute city protesters and we've had some of mm -hmm. the, those sort of take back Alberta adjacent folks. And it yeah. just further marginalizes them from the, the middle and everyone else. And it's, yeah, it's um I I hope you don't get that. I I you know that's 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 terrible, but what I'm interested in is like have you heard from the federal conservatives like surely they don't want gatekeepers running your city, do they? Like well, this surely is another interesting Hollywood thing too. The chain on all of his yeah. guard dogs, isn't he? Like the federal conservative, there was a very interesting dynamic between a few of the federal conservatives and some of the we'll, we'll call them conservative um city councilors through the kind of previous sort of iterations of this of this policy push, but it's been kind of quiet. I don't know. Do, do you have analysis to add there, Catherine? The only thing I can suggest is that, uh, I mean, Pierre Polyev has a really strong lead in the polls right now. And I saw um, a, a suggestion that maybe with such a strong lead, he feels like he can back off on this policy. Cause I haven't, to be honest, heard much from them lately. Which is interesting because last June, I mentioned the Housing Affordability Task Force debacle in Calgary. I think the most effective commentary on that was from Calgary uh, MP Michelle Rumpel Garner, who just came out with a blistering statement on it. I've never agreed with anything more in my entire life than I agreed with what she wrote in response to that. And uh, I've, you know, we reached out to her office and I, I understand that she's very busy and we, but we didn't hear back. And I'm, I'm actually a bit curious to know where they are on this file right now. We have some partisan conservatives involved in our organization and, uh, you know, they're very keen on this gatekeeper narrative and on the fiscal, you know, the property rights component of it. So they're still there. There are still people with conservative leanings, but I do wonder where the federal conservatives are on this. I, I just want to hop in really quick and and redirect things a little bit. First of all, the for the record, uh, the 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 gentleman who allegedly was the primary organizer for Recall Gondek, his name was Landon Johnson. Uh, there we go. I, I there have been no shortage of political pundits and strategic people who have made the very strong argument that this was maybe not for Landon Johnson, but certainly for some of the organizations that that glommed on to the movement, this was more than anything a data mining operation. So it will be fascinating to see whether mm -hmm. or not that data mining translates into any kind of turnout at the hearings. And we will get back to the hearings, I promise. But I want to get back to the other piece of the conversation in regards to the property taxes, because I really feel like the the potential urgency or cities being able to raise some revenue um, was increased uh, today. Um, for anybody who's who's not familiar with what I'm referring to, I'm referring to the announcement from uh, Premier Daniel Smith that there was going to be a legislation table today that would effectively make it so that any organization that flows from the provincial government to the provincial authority can no longer make any sort of deals with the federal government for any kind of funding without having the provincial government involved and the provincial government's approval. Councillor Jantz. Yeah, yes. as I see, I mean, I'm still processing this. It's such a a, a absolutely it's a it's a nuclear move on the part of the province. Like, um, as I understand it, there's fourteen thousand funding agreements, um, at least that would require formal provincial approval, and no new staff have been added to accommodate this new workflow. So, like, there is post secondary agreements, workforce improvement. Like, I'm worried about the economic devastation that this is going to have on 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 it film video games technology all research uh like the future economic diversification let alone our natural resources minerals everything else like this is going to be um like if you're in ai if you're in engineering if you're anything medical if you're in research like 
I don't know what this is what this is going to do. So um, let alone the housing crisis or how it affects cities. I'm worried about it decimating all of the people working uh, and the employment base in Alberta. Like this is uh, um, this is uh, uh, sending riptides across all sectors right now. Um, I like yeah, it's going to totally torque some of our provincial and muni like our municipal funding agreements and everything else. But like shit that's minimal compared to what it's going to do to like all of the businesses in the community well i think businesses if i if my takeaway from the legislation is what's been tabled thus far and lord knows daniel smith's legislation has a history of evolving a little bit uh, through the process but it, it seems to be that this would only apply to organizations uh that are that, that flow from provincial powers. So things like post-secondary, things like municipalities. If you're a private business and you apply for a federal or a grant, well, that's cool. But if you're a major municipality or even a small municipality and you apply for a federal grant, even for something as, as simple as, I don't know, uh, upgrading your cenotaph in the town square, this is now something that is going to require provincial involvement and approval. Um, so I'm curious, I mean, one of the things that I found fascinating and i wanted to get because you're you're a city councilor in edmonton mm. and you've certainly raised this point on social media on more than a few occasions um th there's some issue with provincial property taxes and i just want to make yeah. sure that i i understand well, it's, it's the provincial funding to city so over the last few over the last few decades the provincial government has been constraining the amount of money flowing to flowing to cities for example in 2011 each uh, Albertan got about 450 bucks ahead from the provincial government to go towards capital. It was called the look like the LGFF. And, and uh, so roughly 450 bucks ahead. Now that's down to about 120. And there's many other examples like this. Like um, I've raised the fact that the provincial government used to pay property taxes on their, on their buildings across Alberta. If you had a provincial fish and wildlife office, they paid property tax, have the snow removed, the garbage picked up, et cetera. Now they don't do that anymore. They've reduced that. So um, in Edmonton alone, they owe $60 million back owing since 2019. And they're incurring a bill of, of 15 million a year, which is about 0.7 of a property tax increase in Edmonton. So um, when you look at that, when you look at as well, this is a, an absolute injustice, but the provincial government pays for the clearing and maintenance and care of the Deerfoot. Yet they don't pay for the Yellowhead and the White Mud in Edmonton, our two provincial highways, which are just as important as the Deerfoot to our traffic flow. So there's all these little areas, including the police, when they they put a moratorium on photo radar, that cut about $30 million, $25 million from uh, police funding in Edmonton and, and other municipalities around Alberta. And uh, because the photo radar revenue was going to fund traffic safety for the police. So there's that. There's so many other examples. I mean, we're looking easily at least 5% of the property tax increase right now um, is due to provincial cutbacks and underfunding and neglect of our cities. Our fire department, $28.5 million of their work is dealing with Alberta health work. Fire trucks going to calls that paramedics should have been going to, other things like that. You look at the police, by the police chief's own admission, over 30% of the work they're doing should be mental health addictions, homelessness, paramedics, others, right? And so... It's very hard to run a functional city in a dysfunctional province. Um, and that's true for Calgary, Edmonton, even smaller municipalities are all raising the alarms as well too. So like you look at in Edmonton, one person a day is dying on the streets from a poison drug supply. And um, there's all kinds of work that is just not being done by this provincial government there. And I know you've had other people who have spoken very well on this topic, but look at that, look at homelessness, look at K to 12. We used to have the most education dollars per student in the country. Now we're the lowest. So we're trying to, we're growing in Edmonton. We grew a hundred thousand people in the last two years. We're scheduled to grow another hundred thousand in the next two years, but the provincial government is not, not at all supporting us. And, and I don't begrudge Calgary getting all the money. I like, I support Calgary getting money. I would just want the same money for Edmonton or for anywhere else in Alberta. Right. No matter where you go to school or no matter where you go to a swimming pool, no matter where you drive or bike or train or bus, you should be taken care of by your provincial government. And when we have the biggest, you know, the biggest surplus, the, or the wealthiest province in, in, in history, and we have a provincial government that's still paying for a war room, that's still paying for all of these other wackadoodle initiatives, and they're not 
investing in Albertans, um, what happens? So cities have to make up the difference by raising property tax bills. And it's it's not fair that your property tax should be higher because uh, you live in Edmonton compared to Sherwood Park or compared to Calgary or compared to Galician. Like that's, it's just not right. So, um, and we know more and more people are coming to Edmonton sometimes in, sometimes in desperate need, be it the wildfires, be it from other parts of the country. Like we are, uh, it's, it's, it's grim days. It's grim days and they're making it worse. Like they're not, they're not helping and they're trying to um, blame Gondek and, and in Edmonton blame uh, the city. They're threatening to audit us or whatever, but like the problems of our train platforms, the problems of our streets are the problems of the province. This is, this is really Danielle's own doing. We used to have 1500 unhoused people in 2019. Now it's at 3000. Well, the UCP has been in power since 2019. Like they have not taken action on these sorts of initiatives. So everybody else ends up paying more, paying more car insurance, you know, dealing with like a, just a little crummier quality of life everywhere. And then we've got um, elected officials in cities across Alberta who are still stumping for the UCP, who are still supporting the party. Like, where's your loyalty? You should be supporting your community, not supporting the the uh, um, the party. Well, I think we've seen from some ministers who maybe appeared on TV or not today, there's concerns for upward career mobility from city councils. I don't know. Sure. I'm just... I'm just speculating, but, but yeah, and, and but we as residents should be demanding better, and we should be voting them out. Like anybody who's ten feet of take back Alberta, or or the premier, or any of them should be, um, you know, um, sent packing next election because like what they've done to cities and communities is completely unacceptable, and they they must be held accountable for that. Like we cannot allow Daniel Smith to gaslight us and to gaslight communities that that you know uh, it's somehow uh, municipalities' fault. Um, because of some like decision made years ago or something, you know, um, or Calgary zoning or whatever. No, this is the province is nickel and diming and gutting poor services that are making your quality of life poor. Same in Edmonton. That's a that's a point that I really was hoping that we would be able to get to, because it is fascinating to me that and I, I mean, obviously, I'm somebody who's probably hyper engaged in politics, perhaps to an unhealthy level. Some people might probably definitely do say um, but it, it, it's such a shell game, it seems like, um, that the province is playing because they're doing all of these things to the municipalities and saying, um, hey, we're going to we're going to cut a bunch of stuff, but we're going to do it hiding behind the municipalities. And then everybody can get angry at the municipalities because they don't fully understand the issues. And we do press conferences where we lie a lot. Uh, and I, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you because, you know, I'm not a city councilor and being able to talk to one who can provide some context is very much appreciated. So thank you for that, sir. And it's, it's hard. And I talked to rural municipalities and like, they're getting take back Alberta people coming and, uh, like, so my, my, my thought is Danielle's not worried about the general election. She's worried about the primaries. The primaries are her leadership review. And she is worried that take back Alberta is going to take her out back. And so what she's worried about is just holding their loyalty. That's why um, she's picking on trans kids, everything else. Um, same deal with the city. So um, keep everybody distracted. Keep pick, take back Alberta focused on school boards, focused on rezoning, focused on these things. So they aren't looking at her and what she's doing as premier. Um, they're not looking at the crisis in our healthcare system. They're not looking at wait times that emerge or whatever. Uh, keep them distracted and keep them focused on the municipal elections in 558 days and the federal elections imminently. And so, you know, but the but this the sort of the anti-Trudeau fervor at some point is going to crest, right? And uh, um, be it the election or something else. And uh, um We'll, you know, we'll, we'll see, but, uh, it's, uh, I really, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I really worry when I, when I look at Calgary media, but then I remember also what 10,000 people have subscriptions to the Herald. Is that right? I, I, uh, is it that high? <laughs> so yeah, like, like most, most Albertans don't buy this crap that they're, most Albertans are, are very moderate or very focused on 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 the family go, having a good school a good community um taking care of their loved ones and they're not they're not following this kind of palace intrigue stuff and the more we can just connect with them and talk about how we're making their lives better in a material way that we're adding more services building more rec centers 
adapting for a growing population, a lot legalizing more housing. So your rent's not going up. I mean, I think that's the path to success for cities and towns across, across Alberta. Do you think, and this will be my last question before I like go around the room and then we'll do the call to action. I promise. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that there's an argument to be made that part of the communication strategy for Calgary should be to provide a little bit more education in regards to some of the things that you've listed off here in regards to things that the province has has pulled away from the municipalities. And should Calgary say to Calgarians, uh, whether it's the mayor or city councilors or whoever, uh, should they convey the message to the Calgarians? Hey, you know what? The reality is the province has been screwing with us for quite an amount of time now. And we're trying to do the least destructive, harmful way to, to make sure that we're able to not only continue providing the services that we are providing, but also grow the services that we want to provide for you. And this is the only way that we can do it because they keep messing with their cabbage patch do they is that is that messaging do you think as as some you know it, oh it's critical it's, it's critical not. and it, it can't just come from calgary city council it has to come from neighbors from businesses from everybody else like like um municipalities the chamber of commerce in both cities like they need to vocalize about how when danielle plays these sorts of games with ottawa that it jeopardizes all of our economic prosperity that the housing crisis affects all of us and you know when i talk to many of the key businesses the big the big business leaders they're talking about their number one concern is talent attraction and retention like and and if you're if you're one of these highly skilled laborers who's going to be you know the next founder of the new startup um they 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 say things like i don't want to come to alberta where where my kids are going to you know learn about jesus riding a dinosaur like i don't want to learn about like um, anti-trans rhetoric. I don't want to learn about this kind of like um, back to back to the Bible study kind of education that Daniel's talking about. They want to hear about like a a real 20, 21st century like like city. They want to they want to be a part of a community. They want to be a part of a province where it's welcoming, it's kind, it's loving. It's it's um you know that that kind of urban barn building how we take care of one another. And um uh so I I really think it's critical that some of the major employers. Um, just like in the States when Ron DeSantis started doing the crazy, like, uh, anti-gay stuff in Florida or when the Chick-fil-A guy did his thing, like we, we, we need, we need the business community to push back. Um, we need people to speak up. We need, um, uh, tourist agencies and, uh, like tourism and, uh, all, all those different folks to speak out. And, uh, you know, like, like the, the UCP will blink. Danielle will blink. Like she is nothing, if nothing else is a populist. And if she sees that, like, um, the tides are turning and that actually the housing crisis is the the new big issue. Um, I think, I think they'll back off. I, like ultimately, you know, it's funny because like when I've talked to UCP ministers, they are um, absolutely like so proud of what Edmonton did on the housing file. They're so excited about zoning. So I'm wondering, have they talked to their colleagues in Calgary? Because those Calgary UCP MLAs need to be talking about legalizing housing and making life more affordable because um if their number one concern is affordability and you're going to jack rent up and constrain housing supply, what the hell do you think is going to happen five years from now? Going to run the room now. Catherine, any final thoughts? Uh, what do you want to see from, I mean, I had a whole little thing I was going to do and I got, uh, sorry, right, I'm right, trying sorry. to improvise. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there is this hearing coming up. What are the details on the hearing? What, what do people need to know? And, uh, when will uh, a certain uh, let's go with leather karaoke singer be doing his number? Sorry, a leather karaoke singer. Well, there's there's a certain individual who always speaks at these things, and he's it's, a, it's a Larry Heather reference. <laughs> okay, oh, okay. <laughs> it was a little inside baseball y, so okay. I didn't know if it was going to land or not. It didn't. Oh well. But yeah, when when will Larry Heather be be singing and 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 doing his whole thing about how this will cause a Calgary to go to hell or something? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure he'll be there. I, I look forward to that presentation. So, yes, there's a public hearing. I'm trying to communicate to people that it's happening the week of April 22nd, not just on April 22nd. I think Rob alluded to the fact that a lot of people have already signed up to speak. I know that, uh, you know, we're actively engaged in trying to encourage people to uh, speak up for housing. I know that there are a lot of 
organizations or institutions in opposition to this who are doing the same thing as well. So, um, and I think Rob alluded to this too, that sometimes when you bring up the issue of speaking to counsel, people are like, oh, well, I don't, I'm, I'm not qualified enough. And really you do not need to be qualified in any particular way to speak at counsel. Have you heard and, our uh, opponents? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you are listening to this podcast and you agree with the things that have been said and you are a citizen of Calgary, by all means, uh, there are lots of resources out there to help you sign up. Go to more neighbors, Calgary slash or .ca slash RCG. We've created a web page with some resources and some information on how to sign up. There are some events coming up, including one with Rob and the climate hub on the 18th. Yeah. 18th. A, a virtual training session. Uh, and I'm really trying to emphasize to people that it actually it's, it's fun to speak to counsel and it really feels good to have your five minutes and to say your piece and to get that out there in the world. And, you know, we, we can talk about these things in private chat groups or we can talk about them on Twitter, but it, you, if you care about this, it actually needs to get into the ears of the decision makers who are the 15 people that sit around the horseshoe at Calgary city council. So if you care about your housing future, if you care about the city's housing future, Think about speaking to counsel and at the very least, write your counselor, tell them how you feel, even if it's just to say, I think it's fine. Just do it. All right. Definitely just fine. <laughs> Rob, you're the organizer here. So any any thoughts that you want to sure. share? Where do we and, and specifically, like, I mm -hmm. guess, I mean, if I'm if I'm listening to this podcast and I find myself overcome by the need to uh, either I mean, here's the thing. A anybody who's nervous about speaking to counsel, I would really encourage you to go through the archives and find some of Larry Heather's speeches because <laughs> you're not going to do worse. But Rob, where where should people go if they if they want to? I don't know, register to speak to counsel. What does that What does that process look like? Let's make it e as easy as possible for people. Okay, so that you team up, team me up perfectly. Okay, so the. Easiest way for people to do it. So Climate Hub, we have a training session next Thursday, April 18th. It's virtual, 7 p.m. to 8.30. You know, you can definitely sign up on your own, but the easiest way to do it is just going to be to attend our training. Um, we'll get you briefed on the issue. We'll get you trained on how to deliver a simple and persuasive set of remarks to council. Critically, we'll get you signed up right in the call. Um, so, you know, the, the form, definitely, you know, you can go find it on your own, but it's, you know, Fairly straightforward, but it's, you know, you'll get to an item where it'll say, what agenda item of this council meeting would you like to speak to? And now you're in a world where you have to know where to find the council agenda or if, you know, even entering the right thing in that box actually matters, which it in some ways doesn't. Um, so, you know, you need to know these things. So we'll we'll get you signed up through that form in our call. And then we'll also get you in part of a WhatsApp group with everyone else who's attending the call, you know, if you want to be part of it, where we'll help you logistically kind of on the day of, or as Catherine said, you know, the, I think it's going to be, you know, the days of or the week of um, to get you, you know, understanding, you know, when are you likely to be up to speak, you know, well, um, what's going to happen if you have to miss your call because you're maybe in a meeting or, you know, you have to pick up your kid, you know, and there's ways to get around that as well. But again, you kind of have to know. So we'll help, we'll help, you know, so the easiest way is just to attend our training. I'll be there. Um, I believe Catherine will be there. And um, it's a lot of fun. Like Catherine was saying, you know, I think we've all been involved in this call on political campaigns and it's really rewarding to be part of a team that's working together to make a positive change. And it's the same thing here. We're all going to be part of a team of people that is campaigning to make a big change, you know, not enough of a change, but you know, a big change, a big step forward in this city. And it's, it really, it's the same feeling. You're part of this team that is making that change. And just because I got to use my prop before <laughs> before I stop. So, you know, this is a really important thing for the climate too. You know, I've got my climate policy textbook here. This has informed a lot of my, you know, thinking and kind of advocacy. And, you know, here's what it says. You know, Zoning and building codes should be designed to enable higher density, transit-oriented and mixed-use development without causing individual projects to seek waivers for stuff like use, so like zoning height, setbacks, and so on, you know, as, as you kind of reduce these, this red tape, um, paraphrasing a little bit, you know, that makes it easier for folks to develop, which passes on affordability and emissions reduction opportunities to citizens. 
so you know climate it's a you know this is i think unequivocally this is the right move to make for the climate as we've discussed in the call it's the right reason it's the right thing to do for a bunch of reasons you know from equity to just you know the fiscal prudency of our cities so i don't think i can close better than Catherine already did but you know if you're interested in this issue you know make sure you get engaged and make sure you attend our training session because we'll get you there and we'll make sure that you can have a big impact all right Councillor jance any final thoughts anything else you want people to any advice that you would offer to anyone who's like ah but those city councillors they're yeah scared. there's like there's like these these logical kind of fallacies that people have like oh well you want everybody to live in an apartment you don't understand why people choose single family homes it's like yeah but by legalizing duplexes doesn't mean you have to live in one we're just making that choice available like just because we build a bike lane doesn't mean we're banning cars just because we open a gsa in your child's school doesn't mean you you now have to be gay right like it's 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 a it, it's these these people look at the addition of choice as like a a the number of people who have come up to me and said you know like well, I think houses should be legal. It's like, look around, like they're 99% of our city is still houses. Like we're just allowing maybe, you know, more houses. So it's, it's, it's about, it's, it, it's about having choices. And ultimately that is a very conservative frame. It's a very Calgary frame. Um, it's about taking risks. It's about innovating, especially under, under crisis. And you're giving your kids potentially the ability to have their own property, a lower mortgage, lower utility bills. What more would you want as a parent or grandparent? Hard to hard to think of a better line to end this on. I want to thank all three of you uh, so much for taking the time to chat today uh, and to share your perspectives. I mean, I introduced this by saying that this was going to be a complex, multifaceted uh, mess of a conversation. I think I think we accomplished that. Um, so I want to say thank you to all of you for, for taking your time. Uh, we, we're going to have a very busy note section for this episode because, uh, Councillor Jans provided us with a couple of links and we're going to make sure that we have the links for the, 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 the more neighbors as well as the Calgary climate hub. And then we'll just put the, the straight up dirty, uh, link for the city of Calgary in there for anybody who's feeling particularly brave. Uh, and I think that's. That's all I got. Any other final thoughts anyone wants to throw in before we wrap this up? Just to be prudent, go to calvaryclimatehub.ca, go to the event section. That's where that's where you'll find the event. And I'll give the link to Nate for the show notes as well. So I want to say again, thank you to uh, Catherine Davies, Robert Tremblay, and Councillor Michael Jans from Edmonton for taking the time to have this conversation tonight. And uh, like I said, look for all the links in the show notes. Thanks all. This was great. Thanks. And that's it for another episode of The Breakdown. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here, we would love nothing more than if you thought about signing up to be one of our Patreon sponsors at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab, where for just the price of a fancy cup of coffee a month, you can help us continue to produce this kind of content. Whether you're listening to the audio version of the podcast, in which case maybe leave a, a, a review and a rating or whether you're watching it on one of our streaming platforms we want to say a big thank you to everybody who is part of the breakdowns audience and as always take care of each other and keep the conversation going <laughs>